Hi, my name is Lisa Brody, and everybody watches AccessTV.org. Peace. This is uh, Jonathan Small hosting and producing the Small Report today, August the 14th, 2012, from the downtown access.org uh, studios. Uh, basically, it's a very nice, uh, cool day today. As usual, our summers is kind of a little bit un unpredictable. Today is the Connecticut primary election uh, day. Basically, as I mentioned yesterday, I will give a two to three part segment on where we're at in the political ramifications how important it is to really get involved and believe in the political system. I'm not saying I'm at 100% in the belief category of the political system. I have a few candidates that I have a little bit more faith in than the actual system. Hopefully they can make a difference in the particular political system that exists here today. I think on a national level, we're pretty solid here in Connecticut. I think on a worldwide level throughout the whole entire world, the uh, United States probably still has one of the best political systems. I mean, anytime you have corruptions, it's going to be looked into, it's going to be investigated, comparable to other countries throughout the world where you have uh, elections rigged and all types of scandals beyond the norm. I'm not saying our system is perfect. We have definitely some issues that can always be a problem, but corruption is not the norm. Uh, our country has a standard of not tolerating uh, corruptions as a way of doing politics. Now, how you believe about the political system, uh, who do you put your stock of faith in as the candidate on any particular level, governor, senatorial, state representative, mayor, that's your own personal choice. Um, as I mentioned, this is a two to three part segment dealing with the political system that we have. Today basically is what is your mindset when you make up your mind to determine whether you're going to vote or not vote. Uh, there's three categories of voters. It's people who always vote no matter what the circumstances consist of. There's people who never vote regardless of what the circumstances um, consist of. And then there's that third group of people that it depends on how they feel. If they feel up to it, they're going in that direction, they change their mind, uh, you know, something comes up leading them going into the decision process to vote, they'll vote. But if something else comes along the way, things change throughout the day, they don't have their mind 100% made up. It's kind of a 50-50 uh, category for that third group of people. The registered voters here that we have in many different levels, uh, the numbers are going to be low. Um, now, you can make the argument it's the summertime, it's the time of the year where people are traveling, uh, it's a lot of instability, and nobody really can't stay focused uh, for different reasons at this particular time of the year. And November has the uh, statistical data, it's going to be a higher turnout comparable to now. Um, but then again, there's another side to that argument, too. Um, we had November, as I mentioned yesterday, with our mayoral election here in the capital city, Hartford, and there was an all-time record low. People, I mean, we did actually have a storm uh, that happened about a week before the uh, election, but I think even if it wasn't a major storm or a storm, I don't think the numbers were going to really be that high. It's always a difference in most cases uh, between, you know, urban centers and urban cities to smaller suburbanized towns. Uh, I think that's a national issue you can find. But the bottom line is, you know, what is your decision that's going to determine when you wake up in the morning whether you're going to cast your vote or you're not going to cast your vote? You know, what do you really believe in? Do you believe in this system? Do you think this system is designed to do what it's um, presented to do? when it comes time to making a decision of the electoral political system. The level of what people need to look at 
is having some form of belief in the candidates and the belief in the political system is this going to translate into political empowerment? Uh, you need to put yourself in the belief and in, in the mindset that I have a process that I can work towards to obtain political empowerment, not just to vote and leave it at the door of the candidate that you vote for and then you don't have any idea what's going on in the electoral process. You feel totally disconnected just because you did one particular civic duty, which is very important. That doesn't mean that that's the process to obtain political empowerment. Political empowerment is a major solution towards what people in any particular community needs. Uh, economic empowerment is connected to political empowerment, especially here in the United States. Uh, many other countries might not have that uh, same structure of political empowerment as the number one or number two priority. It's still an important uh, process to always believe in the political system. But it's ignored so many people in many different categories over the decades. It gives people the belief, again, that the political system and the candidates are just going to do what they want to do. Um, one candidate that I'm considering strongly voting for has already told me he's not going to be able to spend much time in the Harford area of the Fish District. We have, a, like I say, for my district that I have to vote in is combined with the Windsor-Harford area a new form district because the population base in this area of Harford has just dropped and not grown enough and the Windsor base has grown a lot more and they actually have more registered voters in Windsor for this particular fifth district than they do in Harford. And Harford is still the capital city, it's still the second largest city in Connecticut, but yet you don't have the large base of registered voters comparable to a smaller town like Windsor, which is right outside the borderline of Hartford. Um, and the expectations or the statistical data is that you're not going to have many registered voters in Hartford turning out to vote. And I think that would be a problem even going into November because you have to have some type of understanding on why people are not voting anymore and they don't take the whole electoral process serious. I mean, if you drive through any particular settings and you look at your community and it's a high rate of unemployment, it's a lot of negativity, uh, it's a lot of social damage, it's a lot of non-neglect, and then you never see any particular candidate or any elected official come around in your neighborhoods to try to address any changes, and then all of a sudden, about a couple of weeks before the up-and-coming election, you start to see more faces that could be a turn off uh, signal for you right now that why I'm seeing this candidate now and I haven't seen him or anybody else over the past two to three years before this previous election. So the hopelessness and the, and the apathy that people make up their mind that they're not going to vote is ingrained. I think it's passed from one generation to the next. I think that's another part of a major problem that we're having in this country. When you have a particular underclass structure that relies on a system. Now, people that are in this under, underclass structure, the Department of Social Service, they do realize one thing, though. Politics can play a role in that level of services because, you know, there's been the old norm that the Democrats are the ones that rely heavily on the, you know, the um, underclass population base that's locked into the Department of Social Services. People perceive that as handouts, and they try to give those classifications or those class of people just enough to keep them in place to where they can always depend on them for their vote. So at the same time, people that represent those people in these particular agencies, the Department of Social Services, do inform people that this particular candidate is the best candidate to provide this particular service. So you need to vote for this person instead of the other candidate because it's particularly a conservative level. They're talking about reducing uh, aid towards certain social programs, and that could almost be jeopardy to many people that that's all that they have to uh, rely on. So I think on that level, you have a group of people who do understand the importance of uh, elected candidates that will keep those services available and they will go out there and vote or they'll try to advocate the people if they're not in a position 
uh, to be a registered voter that they need to vote for that particular candidate. But that's still a big game. That's not a real long-term solution to the problem. I think we need to build our country beyond just having people locked into one particular level of social services. But the political problem of having the belief, and I mean, it's a whole different level probably today than it was even 50 years ago because you have a lot more money now involved in the political system than you did probably 50 years ago. You have more multi-millionaires that's running for election. And as I mentioned, I did try, or actually I did work with Governor Dan Malloy's campaign staff in 2010, and I learned a lot uh, just at that one particular level as a campaign volunteer. The campaign staff that exists, what I was able to find out, is they want a lot of volunteers. They don't really want many paid staff uh, positions. Uh, although you will have certain candidates that will hire more staff than others, uh, but they prefer the volunteerism of having people volunteer because that you know saves them a lot of money when you're running a campaign and you get the numbers up that you need. But it's a game that many people try to follow into. You do something for me, I do something for you. That was not the true intention on how the political system was started and the way it was established. Established as an elected candidate, goes out there, tries to provide the services and run government efficient to meet the basic needs of the consistency that he is representative. Uh, over the, a period of time, somewhere along the line, people have found out that you can play politics where you can always get something from your vote or your time or your service, which I think you do need to be making sure that you're not wasting your time and wasting your service. I mean, when I was helping the Governor Dan Malloy's campaign, I ended up spending some of my own money driving all the way down to uh, downstate in Stanford, uh, right outside of New York City. Uh, they told or tell me that they provide food and drinks. It ends up that when you go down there, it's no more than, you know, a few snacks and a few juices. It's not a full-time meal. Uh, then I find out later on that some of these candidates, they don't pay the volunteers, obviously, because that's a volunteer on position. But you look at their budget and how much money they spend and what some of these campaign managers can make off of these elections. I mean, one person that worked for a particular candidate made over a half a million dollars in that short period time in that short period of time of running this person's particular election. That's not a bad way to make a living if you could make about a half a million dollars within a year running a candidate's election. Um, and the, you know, the sad part about it is that could be the norm now that many people will start to, to uh, aim for. And I guess in the political ramifications, you have to have a elect, select group of people that know what they're doing. Their expertise is very valuable. So you know, it costs a lot of money to run a particular campaign. And I guess all of those things have to be looked into when you make your decision on you know, how much you're going to pay a, pers uh, pay a particular staff. But, you know, when you have record numbers of spending that took place the previous two years and then you look at the end result, the person still ends up losing, um, money doesn't really guarantee you of being elected. It's definitely a big help when you get into advertisements. But I think for the residents and the people on the outside, to them, they just don't understand anything about the whole political system. It's, it takes a lot of our research and expertise to understand the whole political circles and just to make up your mind or to believe that you need to go out there and cast a vote that takes some perseverance and if you haven't been a registered voter you've never voted or you vote very rarely that's not an easy automatic transitionary process so basically what I'm saying today is what do you determine as your main factor to deciding whether you're gonna vote or not vote uh, it's still an individual final decision there's so many advertisements people coming around your house people blowing all the types of sound bites but you still have to make the final decision it's not the legal level of somebody to force you to go and pick you up out of your house and drag you down to any particular polling stations 
you got to make your own uh, decision. They will be calling your house to find out whether you voted or not. Uh, many people are just not going to vote. I think this is a sad problem that we have in our society, but sometimes it has to be clearly examined. You know, why do people vote and why do people not vote? Up, uh, up and coming tomorrow, I'm just going to do a little follow-up on the numbers, basically, you know, how many people turned out, what particular candidates had won, and then try to move on to a whole different level way beyond this. But I think, people, you just need to wake up and make up your mind. Is it something that you believe in? Do you make up your mind on whether you're going to vote or not vote? And I would.